is trained, he knows exactly what to do to go make this rescue and how to take care of, of, of this couple and who to rescue first, what to do first, what steps to take. So of course he's just following his procedures and what he's been trained to do. So trying to load this wife in, the husband jumps over his back. Um, so long story short, as he's trying to fight him off, he ends up punching him gives him a bloody nose and now he's floating in the water thinking he's drowning or something like that. It was a little bit dramatic, so to speak. But so uh, subsequently, Kevin Costner has to pull the wife out of the basket and load the husband because he's now bleeding everywhere. So he loads him in the basket and sends him up and uh, as the, the gentleman gets in the, uh, the helicopter, the uh, flight engineer who's assisting and taking care of everything in the cabin uh, is dealing with this man. He says, he broke my nose. I, I can't believe he did that. And the, the flight engineer said, well, you might have just drowned your wife because now the wife who had taken on, who had swallowed in water is now, so to speak, drowning. So Kevin Costner's in the water trying to uh, give her the Heimlich in water, which I, I've done as a lifeguard, it's not easy. Uh, trying to give her CPR, trying to resuscitate her. They send the basket back down, bring her up. They do CPR, save her life in the helicopter. The whole point of this is the man was purely worried about self. Now, I don't know how far I can fault him because I, I think we would all probably think somewhere along the same lines if we're out in the middle of the frigid ocean and, and worried about our safety, but his wife needed to be rescued first. That was the priority. He was worried about self. And that's what the scene depicted and what it showed is his concern was for self at that time. The movie goes on and, and after a, a traumatic experience, the uh, uh, senior chief, his name was Ben actually, Ben Randall, played by Kevin Costner, is assigned to go down to A school, which is the Coast Guard's uh, training uh, facility and training academy for the rescue swimmers. And so here he shows up, and, and of course our other main character, Ashton Kutcher, uh, um, who was, I guess, wildly popular at the time. He was just about in every movie that was made during that time. But he portrays um, a, a, a recruit for this uh, rescue swimmer academy, and. Um, it's pretty easy to see as soon as you get started what he's all about in this movie. And as you can probably surmise, he's about self. So he was the, the champion swimmer in high school. He had plenty of offers to go uh, uh, swim in college and do all these great things with his swimming career, but somehow he chooses the Coast Guard. So he's already enlisted in the Coast Guard and now he's at A school. The, premier uh, um, um, training regimen for uh, the Coast Guard rescue swimmers. And so one of the first uh, um, activities or, or uh, trials that they go through in this school is they're thrown in the pool in their facility and told to uh, tread water for an hour. An hour. Now I'm a, I'm a very good swimmer. We've got a boat. We do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, I know Tim's a, an excellent swimmer, an avid swimmer. We've got plenty of swimmers in here, but an hour? I mean, I'll give you five minutes. I mean, if one of the kids is going underwater or Catherine needs help or something, I'll jump in and get them, but tread water for an hour? So as the, uh, as the scene goes on, uh, one of his, um, and, and this, by the way, is after Ashton Kutcher's character named Jake Fisher, um, professes that he's there to save lives, that he's there to sacrifice and help others. And yet, here's one of his classmates. They get about halfway through the exercise, so impressive. Uh, they, they've been treading water for 30 minutes, and this muscle-bound guy, just slightly smaller than our own Jackson Denton, um, discovers that muscle is very hard to keep afloat when you're treading water. Uh, don't try it out on Jackson. I don't know that that would work very well, but um, halfway through this exercise, he starts cramping up and going under. And so he reaches out for help and he grabs this guy and he grabs uh, uh, Jake Fisher just trying to get his head above water. They both shrug him off. And he goes under, he touches the bottom of the pool, kicks up, he's now eliminated from A school. He, he just got kicked out with that one challenge right there because he couldn't complete this trial or the, this challenge. And as they're, they're getting pulled out of the water to, to, I guess, rest and go on with their, their next exercise, 
Jake swims to the side and, and Senior Chief Randall uh, kind of pushes him back in the water and says, I thought you were here to save lives. And yet you're not willing to save one of, one of your uh, fellow classmates here. And he said, I, I didn't think it was part of the exercise. Self. The epitome of self right there. The man's drowning in the pool, whether they're all excellent swimmers or not, and, and whether they're there for a purpose or not, he's drowning in the pool. And he was let to, uh, to just sink, apparently. Um, as we go on, he uh, uh, starts the class and says, uh, this is in front of the entire class and the command for the A school and, and all of this stuff. And, and he says, Captain, I, I have just one question. The guy that holds all these swimming records right here, the 1500 meter freestyle, the, uh, the backstroke, all these different rescue techniques and different things, who, is he still alive? And the captain says, well, why do you ask? And he says, self, I just thought you ought to let him know that I'm about to knock his name off the board. And the captain says, really, why don't you let him know yourself? He's standing right behind you in the back of the room. And who is it but Senior Chief Randall himself who's been putting them through these exercises that holds all these records? And so you see, and, and I won't go through the whole movie here, but as, as you see, you have all of these undertones of self and getting out of just making it about self, about yourself and what you're capable of doing or what your desires are. They go through this whole discourse here. Uh, there's even a challenge where apparently uh, Senior Chief Randall in, in Alaska is married but never sees his wife. He's addicted to his job. He's addicted to, a, while seemingly a noble cause, he neglects his marriage and almost just forgets about his wife. So they go through the progression of, of um, uh, unfortunately, she leaves him, and, and he doesn't realize until it's too late that um, it was about self. He made it about self, even though a, a very noble cause in rescuing lives, he made it about self. Uh, from Lamentations 3, verses 19 through 26, it says, I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. Sound familiar? We do a good job singing it. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait in him. So you see a little bit of a change here in the first three verses where self, self, self. And now the acknowledgement, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is who feels that. The Lord is who takes care of that need. Therefore, I will wait in him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So as you see, as we're taught, and, and we see it all throughout Scripture, it's not about self. It's not about self. Now, on to our next topic, other gods. And I titled it this way because we tend to run into uh, uh, choosing to place things, possessions, ideals, idols, if you will, or something better before God. Um, a passage that we studied uh, a couple weeks ago in our, in our uh, adult Sunday morning class in here, and we're still uh, actually finishing up 1 Thessalonians this morning, but something we came across here as Paul was writing to this church, it says in verse, starting in verse 8, the Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell about how you turn from God, uh, turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. What I fear is that unlike the Thessalonian church that this letter was written to, many Christians in recent years have found new idols to put into place. And I, I don't by any means say that to say that uh, suggesting idols have become a part of our lives to supplant God completely. 
but they certainly are a strong distraction uh, in a, a much better and higher calling. Another uh, warning that we get comes uh, uh, to the church at Rome um, in verses eight, um, I'm sorry, chapter eight, verses one through 14. It says, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, other gods, other idols, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, self other idols, other ideals. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if the Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, he will also give life to your mortal bodies because of your Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. It is not to idols, better ideas, uh, thinking we have somehow found a better way. For it is you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are in the children of God, are the children of God. So an idol that has seemingly taken over uh, people's lives is technology. And not technology by itself, but more specifically the internet, social media. Um, sure, it makes a great tool when prepping for a sermon as we have a projector right here. I've used PowerPoint. I've got an iPad. I'm going to get my laptop out later and, and set it up for uh, teaching a class. But what from those things uh, do you allow to get in the way? Um, one reference I pulled from the social dilemma, um, a former Google designer and software engineer expressed in this movie that the original hope was to make software less addictive. Does that sound right? Is that the way it is? Now what is uh, widely understood is that tech companies don't sell their products anymore. They sell their customers. Now, let me clarify that a little bit. They sell their customers to their advertisers because that's their, that's, uh, uh, their true customers is their advertisers. Those are the ones paying the money. They sell your attention as a user. Uh, to help this really hit home, um, here's a quote from Edward Tuft. He's a statistician and a professor from Yale University. And he says, there are only two industries that call their customers users. Illegal drugs and software. <laughs> and so this side kind of makes sense then. Uh, uh, there, there's two users. What about just Google it? Uh, it's become so easy to just jump in and, and I, I'll skip right around whatever search engine uh, um, I've got on my work computer or my home computer or whatever it is, and I'll go to Google to search. And another question is, why do you think Google's main page is just plain white? They don't put any advertising on it. They don't want to advertise on that page. It would distract you from what you came there for. No, they need you to go deeper. They need you to go further. So they want you to go ahead and search what you're looking for and then search for another term and another product, uh, another piece of information. And then they've got you. From there, once you've gone far enough down the rabbit hole, they can create the Ben algorithm, or the Wendy algorithm, or the Brad algorithm. And they know how to follow you, and they know how to track you, and they know how to show you what they think you want to see. And it's very, very good. Um, what I want to do is take us into 
our next example. Uh, you might have seen this as well. It's called the social network. It, it, uh, it gives an expose on how Facebook was founded, how it was created, and gives the dark side of it. Um, for those of you who might be connected to me on Facebook, by the way, you've probably seen that I did quite a bit of market research this week. I posted about 100 times this week, but uh, it was a great tool and a great way to, to capture uh, all the, the memories and fun pictures and, and share kind of what we were up to there. And that way Catherine could keep track of me and knew what we were up to and that the girls were still alive and <laughs> somewhat flourishing. <laughs> so what we find out in this movie, The Social Network, is there's idols involved, and, and I'll give some clarification to make some connections here as to what those are. Let's see if we go there. The first idol is revenge. Uh, this young lady is, is here to kind of depict um, Mark Zuckerberg, the, the founder of Facebook, his girlfriend. And so they get into this intense conversation at dinner, and, and they just go back and forth, and it almost becomes a battle of wills. And I, I, I'd hate to say that, that maybe Catherine and I have had this kind of conversation before, but I, I never want to be in that kind of setting or, or conversation where they're just wearing each other out. And near the end of the opening scene, they end up breaking up and, and getting into a fight, and, and this, this turns in, goes from intensity to just this flat-out argument. So they end up breaking up, and uh, um, she says, you know, I, I hope we can still be friends, the, the age-old sentiment. And he says, I don't want to be friends. And uh, she grits her teeth and says, I was being polite. I have no intention of being friends with you. Ouch. Well, Mark will show her. He goes back to his dorm, uh, is a little bit inebriated, and creates a website that compares people. Get this. I'm being discreet, compares people to one another. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And completely trashes this young woman and her reputation on campus. And she doesn't even go to Harvard. She goes to another college down the street there in Boston. Completely trashes her reputation. I thought about 1 Peter 3, 9. It says to sum up... Um, I'm sorry, let me start in verse 8. To sum up, all of you, be harmonious sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Uh, verses 10 through 12, which we read right there, is actually a quote from Psalm 34. And it's designed to reinforce the idea or, or the thought of uh, a blessing of turning away from evil and doing good. And, and uh, what a nice reinforcement right here. So our next idol or ideal is selfish ambition. So on the left there, you have the Winklevoss twins who, whether, whether you like it or not, or where, where you stand on that, actually had the idea of what spearheaded Facebook. They uh, subsequently uh, filed a lawsuit and, and won that lawsuit and won $65 million, and I think there's some other details behind it. Um, the other side is Eduardo Saverin, who was Mark's best friend at the time, who was his inspiration, who <laughs> bent over backwards. He, he went all over the place trying to help him uh, get this started, who funded the company with $19,000, which was a lot back then, enough to get a software company started. Uh, he now owns 4 to 5% of the company and is worth about $5 billion. And of course, those figures are, are rough there. but. Um, he lost his best friend over 19, not over the billions and billions of dollars that the company is worth, but over 19,000. He lost his best friend. From James 3, uh, verses 14 through 17, and those of you who were in my James class, you'll remember vividly what uh, chapter 3 talks about. But in verse 14 it says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, 
Do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it's earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. And for the sake of time, let's go to our third here, money. As Justin Timberlake so aptly portrayed, uh, Sean Parker, he's the former founder of Napster and now an owner in Facebook, he pointed out a million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? A billion dollars. Simply money, simply chasing that dollar. Facebook now is worth $600 billion. So he said, don't worry about a million dollars. A billion dollars is cool. And they're now worth $600 billion of it. Uh, I won't go through this. Let, let's read verses 14 and 15 uh, from Joshua 24. You've heard this passage before. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, uh, which were beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in which the land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then our last point this morning is... Those that choose to serve anything but God, that search and seek for anything except God to serve and, and to have in place. And so, of course, for that, I picked the matrix. I don't know how well it's going to fit, but we're going to give it a try. Uh, the Matrix, uh, you, our protagonist, our main character, Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, is contacted by Morpheus, uh, 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 the leader of a movement to awake those who are captive to the Matrix. And what he does is he offers Neo a choice. You can pick the red pill or the blue pill. The blue pill, you, you take, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and you believe whatever you want to believe, the world. He stays in the world. He stays with the status quo. He stays with a sense of contentment and doing things the way they've always been done. For some of us, that sounds very familiar with how we went about things before we became Christians. We just went about it. We just did it. We did whatever we wanted to do. We did what we thought was right. What Morpheus tells Neo when he first meets is, I bet you feel like you're somewhat somewhat like Alice. He says, Alice, Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole. Well, if he takes the red pill, you stay in Wonderland and you find out just how deep the rabbit hole goes. You find out that there's a better way. You find out that there's a different way of doing it. And then, then what uh, they aim to, to show Neo and expose him to is the fact that this is complacency. This is the world. This is what you've been programmed to do, and we want to show you a better way. We want to show you a different way. It sounds a lot like the world now. And so a couple of examples that I wanted to share um, from uh, Jonah. Jonah did a great job with one thing he was tasked to do in, in, in our, our teachings in Scripture. And by my estimation, he did three really not great things. He chose, as, as we can recollect in Scripture, three times anything but God. The first being in chapter 1, verse 3, when he runs, and, and I've given this example before, it would be an easy three-day journey to go to Nineveh and proclaim what he was called to proclaim. It would have taken him months to get to Tarshish where he was trying to flee, including camel rides, walks, boat rides, transfers between islands. Uh, it would have taken a substantial amount of work and effort just to get where he was fleeing to. And yet God had his path laid out for him and his calling laid out for him. The second being, he chose not to trust God. God would have been there to, to, to save him and continue him on his mission as he's on the ship, and yet he tells the sailors, throw me overboard. Just, just be gone with me. He chose to, to, the, the sea and drowning, anything except God. And then, of course, uh, um, kind of comical here, but in, in um, chapter 4 of, of the book of Jonah, he then resents God. He chooses to sit and sulk at, at 
uh, the salvation unfolding, unfolding in front of him uh, for, for the Ninevites. So to finish up this morning, I want to take us through uh, uh, Colossians 3, um, something we see in our bulletin each week, uh, Colossians 3.17, and we'll go through pretty quickly here. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Let's move forward a little bit. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Self. Do not lie to each other since you have taken all, off your old self with its practices and put on the new self. Verse 12, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As we wrap up here this morning, the, the three points to kind of counter what we studied this morning that I want to expose you to is, one, God chooses you. It's over and over again in Scripture. In John 15, 16, he said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Ephesians 1, 4, he said, He chose us in him before the creation of the world. In 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people. Not only does God choose us, but the word favors us. From 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, And we thank God continually because you... When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. From Joshua 1.8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, uh, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And then Ephesians 1.11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And then third, the body of Christ is here for you. Why? Simply because we love you. It's been demonstrated us for us to do that, and we choose to serve you serve those in need, serve those in our community, and to serve ultimately God because God calls us to do it because he loved us enough to do it that we love him. And so as we conclude this morning, I admonish you, choose God, choose Christ, choose our Savior. If anyone among you uh, has the need of the church for prayer, for support, for uh, uh, just uplifting, or if you're in sorrow, we've got elders all over the place. We've got ministers in the back and on the sides. We'd be more than happy to pray for you. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to wash you anew, to remove your debt of sin, and to give you a new life so that you can live uh, with him forever in salvation, please come forward as we stand and sing. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hand than to be the King of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's 
Jesus applause I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of the vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, I'll follow him. Please be seated. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty side and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the whole Holy Lamb of God, oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died, the humble king. They named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood till I am just a Lamb of God. Uh, allow me to uh, share a story about the importance of communion with you this morning. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German minister and theologian who was an enemy of the Nazis because he refused to go along with their state idea 
of a church that practiced anti-Semitism of the Nazis. In fact, he was a hunted man who upheld authentic Christian principles. As part of the German underground, he was not able to safely worship with his friends. Bonhoeffer knew there was no other community and fellowship like that experience within the body of Christ. He said, baptism brings us into the unity of the body of Christ. And the Lord's Supper fosters and sustains our fellowship and communion in that body. During the Nazi reign, Bonhoeffer was cut off from other believers, and it took a toll on him. Bonhoeffer, painful, painful discovery is instructive to us. Cut off from the nurturing fellowship of other Christians, he felt deeper, a deeper <coughs> hunger for the fellowship that was no longer available to him. We, too, should spiritually hunger to have a closeness with God and Jesus. And one of the ways that we remember having that feeling of closeness is by taking the Lord's Supper together. Let us pray. Our Father, please be with us as we eat this bread and we take this cup, remembering everything you have done and continue to do for us, your children, and as your followers. Please be with us. For it's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Make sure your communication cards are passed to an aisle. Kids, y'all can take those up at this time. Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Where I'm bound, yes, where I'm bound. Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Where I'm bound. There's nothing but love in that land. Nothing but love. In that land, there's nothing but love in that land where I'm bound. Yes, where I'm bound, there's nothing but love in that land. Nothing but love in that land, there's nothing but love in that land where I'm bound. There's nothing but joy in that land. Nothing but joy in that land, there's nothing but joy in that land. Where I'm bound, yes, where I'm bound, there's nothing but joy in that land. Nothing but joy in that land, there's nothing but joy in that land. Where I'm bound, 
There's nothing but peace in that land. Nothing but peace in that land. There's nothing but peace in that land. Where I'm bound, yes, where I'm bound. There's nothing but peace in that land. Nothing but peace in that land. There's nothing but peace in that land. Where I'm bound. So don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Where I'm bound, yes, where I'm bound. So don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Where I'm bound. All right, well, uh, before Greg does his thing, uh, we do want to acknowledge a, a couple more people that we have baskets for. Um, uh, it, Ashlyn, if you want to go ahead and come up, and Brittany and Jackson, if y'all want to go ahead and come up. Um, uh, we always like to acknowledge our, our new members. Like we said, we hadn't done it in a while, so uh, uh, now's the time you get to, to be acknowledged. Uh, we'll start with, uh, well, yeah, you, you give them a hand. <laughs> So, uh, Ashlyn, uh, just, just you, get, you get to go off the cuff since you didn't turn a piece of paper in. So, Ashlyn, <laughs> uh, where do you go to school and what grade are you going into? Greenbrier High School. I'm going into 11th grade. She had to think. She had to think about it. But it hadn't happened yet. So, um, And what are some of your hobbies that you enjoy doing? Um, I cheer and I play tennis. Tennis. Oh, I didn't know that one. That's a new one. Good, good. And um, just what's something special about you that most people probably don't know that you could share about yourself? <laughs> I don't know. Something fun. Something silly. What, what, what's one of your favorite things to do? I like to hang out with my sister. All right, that's good. Wow, that, that's I, my siblings won't. I mean, my kids won't say that about their siblings. <laughs> but um, uh, favorite and last but not least, favorite food. Chicken. Chicken. All right, her and Lady Kate will get along fine. All right, now we've got uh, Brittany and Jackson Denton. You can move over. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, where do you guys work? Uh, I work at Sutherland Inc. Which is? It's a mattress manufacturing company. And you never would have, you probably never would have figured that out uh, if she hadn't told you. All right, Jackson? I work for Eagle Parking. I manage parking lots. All right. Hey, that, there's good money in that. I know. If you go downtown, goodness. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, what are some of your hobbies? Um, we like to play. <laughs> we, we like to play video games together. That's awesome. Uh, what are some of your hobbies, Jackson? Uh, I also play video games. <laughs> um, I'm a nerd. Uh, I like I like Spider-Man stuff, that's and Star Wars. Uh, I'm not a very interesting person. Oh, that's not true. Uh, and he also does a good Thor impression. Very good Thor. If you were at camp, you'll get that one. Um, and uh, any just anything else? Some fun fact about yourselves? Some you know, one of your favorite things, or you know, to do, or one of your favorite people? Um, but anyway, uh, what? Uh, we're getting a dog in two weeks. Oh, that's uh, we got we got a lot of that going around. I think it's it's kind of contagious. The ball's just got a got a dog, uh, Jack. So there's a new new family member we need to add to the to the role. We need to add Jack, and we'll find out who who we're adding with you guys. And then last but not least, uh, favorite foods? Chicken. Fried chicken. Oh, I love that. <laughs> All right, y'all can sit. Give them a hand. Welcome them. We're going to do the video next week. Yeah. So we're going to change the plans. We were going to do the decades video this week. We're going to actually change it to next Sunday. So you guys will um, hopefully enjoy that next Sunday. Um, but just want to share a few announcements. Uh, first of all, just uh, echo what Matt said earlier. We had just a tremendous week at camp, and you could really see um, God working uh, throughout there. So thank you so much for your prayers and, and uh, for that week. And, and we thank you so much for, for all those who are visiting with us this morning. We are very grateful to have you uh, join us in worshiping, and we hope that, that you feel as an honored guest, hope that you give us a chance to, to get to know you a little bit and that you come back to worship and to fellowship with us uh, any, any opportunity that you have to do so. 
We do have one change uh, to our prayer list. Uh, Randall Wilson, uh, that is the uh, father of Melissa Goostry, um, has moved to Skyline Rehab, uh, and that's in room uh, 319A, so a change there. Uh, but continue to pray for him and be lifting him up. We also want to extend uh, the love and sympathy of the congregation to the family of Bob White. Uh, that was a former uh, Riverwood member. Uh, there will be a celebration of life in Knoxville, um, and there will be a graveside at uh, Spring Hill Cemetery uh, with military honors, uh, but the dates are not finalized yet for that, so we'll get those out whenever we get that. We also want to extend the love and sympathy uh, to the family of James Herschel Wilson. That's the nephew of Mary Wilson. And arrangements right now are, uh, yes. Okay, so he, he will be brought back to Cleveland, uh, Tennessee, and proceed from there. Uh, this evening, uh, we are going to have our fifth Sunday uh, service night, and, and it's going to be geared around setting up for our homecoming, um, August 14th. So um, it's going to be a lot, a lot more physical labor than maybe our um, mostly physical labor and, and setting up and cleaning out classrooms and cleaning up uh, just around the building, just kind of uh, just checking every everything so if you have the opportunity to come out that's going to be from four to six we'll have dinner uh, after that dinner provided uh, but i encourage you if you have the opportunity to help out tonight that would be greatly appreciated as we have a, a lot of work to do to to get set up for that uh, our father-son baseball trip is this week and there will be a brief meeting uh, just immediately once i'm done we'll just meet up here uh, briefly uh, for all those who are planning on going on that the youth ha are going to holiday world thursday um, and then there's a ladies' night out. The next ladies' night out is August 8th. That's at Firehouse, Firehouse Subs in Hendersonville. So be sure and see Brittany uh, if you would like to attend that. And then just don't forget, August 13th and 14th. August 13th is going to be our church uh, picnic uh, celebration of our 70th anniversary. That will be at Lytton Park. Um, and that's from 11 to 3. Uh, the only thing you need to bring is yourself. And, and if you can bring a lawn chair to, uh, to sit, that'd be great. But we'll have hot dogs, chips, drinks, uh, and some games and, and enjoy some fun on Saturday. And then on August 14th will be our 70th uh, anniversary celebration and worship together. And worship will be as normal at 930. Encourage you to get here at 9 and enjoy coffee and fellowship before. And then we'll have a meal afterwards uh, after worship. There is sign-up sheet in the back to be able to bring some desserts um, so if you get a chance to, to sign up for that but uh, more importantly just be praying for that for that weekend that we uh, that all goes well and that that it is a blessing and and we glorify God uh, through that and then also one last thing uh, Labor Day camp is coming up that's September 3rd through 5th uh, so if you are interested um, in that uh, we'll have more details that are coming out but uh be be sure and see uh corey uh, and check with him yes yeah, do, uh, we're gonna have a sign up sheet next week i know we're running late today so next week we'll have a sign up sheet for that uh and you can let us know you come yeah Awesome. And then uh, just uh, be sure and look through the church bulletin as there's different ways to help. One is if you have any um, any crepe myrtles uh, uh, to be able to cut any cuttings for that, uh, be sure and see Cindy Graham uh, to get that for decorations for the homecoming. So once again, thank you so much just for... Uh, what a blessing it is to be able to come together and to worship and the love that you show uh, to each other, but more importantly, to God and serving him each and every day. We thank you for being here this morning. You are dismissed for class.